All right, well, if we go back in time a little bit to um, Advent season in December, right when Advent came, we had just began to explore the book of origins, the book of origins, which we now know is the book of Genesis. We started with an overview of creation in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, and we capped it off with a beautiful visit from Creation Ministries International, who supplied us with many excellent resources that are available at the back on that literature rack there on the left-hand side. I guess if you're looking at it, yeah, that'd be the left-hand side there. Incredibly beautiful materials. If you'd like to take some out, take some home for a week or two, bring it back, put it back. Um, I'm benefiting from those materials, and I know that you will as well. Excellent stuff. But the first big question that Genesis deals with is this question. Why is there something rather than nothing? The book of Genesis uh, takes that on head on right at the very beginning. The answer, of course, is very simple. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's why there's something rather than nothing. And for many... Not all, but for many, that is an extremely satisfying answer. Why is there something here? Well, houses don't appear. Houses are made by builders. Uh, Why are there people around here? Well, people don't just appear. Uh, People are made by their parents. And why is there a universe here? Well, universes, they don't just appear out of nothing. They are made. Someone has done this. And the book of Origins, Genesis, says God has done this. But let me now take a step back before we go any further and ask this question. Who wrote the book of Genesis? All together on the count of three. One, two, three. Moses. Moses. Here's another question. Have you ever wondered how is it that Moses knew what happened in the beginning? How did Moses know what happened in the very beginning? Because even with the Holy Spirit's guidance, and you know, we understand that the Bible was written with the Holy Spirit guiding those who wrote the words down, we know that even with the Holy Spirit's guidance, the authors, the human authors, always knew something about what they were writing. It wasn't like they're little robots or little computers and they just typed it out, you know, as someone else was moving their strings or their hands. Uh, They knew what they were writing. They knew what they were talking about. The writers of the scriptures write intelligently. They write rationally. They write based on things that they know. But how did Moses know what happened in the very beginning. How did he know what happened in the Garden of Eden? How did he know what happened uh, during the Great Flood? Good question. Well, let's try to answer it. Like all the books in the Bible, the book of Genesis is divided into chapters. This is a little fun fact I learned this week. All the chapter notations in the Bible, they were added in the 13th century A.D., Someone thought, a scribe thought, it'd be a good idea for us to have, be able to be able to find different parts in the Bible, and so he added the chapter notations. That took place in the 13th century. But the book of Genesis has something additional. Not just, you know, the fact that there's 51 chapters in Genesis. Genesis also has another set of divisional statements. Let me show you. Have you ever read the book of Genesis and seen the phrase, this is the account of? Hands? Did you see that? This is the account of. It happens nine times in the book of Genesis. Chapter 2, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 10, chapter 11, twice, 25, 25, and 36. What is this? This is the account of. Well, these are essentially footnotes and bibliographical references that are inserted by the author whose name is Moses in order to, now get a load of this, document his sources. That's what scholars do. 
If you've ever read a scholarly book or a scholarly article, they document their sources. So Moses is not just the author, the inspired author of Genesis. More accurately, Moses is the editor, the editor of Genesis. He's compiling information that was written by others. Who are the others you're talking about, Pastor? He's writing information that was written by, wait for it, Adam, Seth, Noah, Terah, Abraham. This is how Moses could write about the Garden of Eden. This is how he could write about the fall of man. This is how he could write about the flood. This information came from those who were there. This information came from Adam, from Noah, from others. Similarly, this is how he could know that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and he did it in six days. He rested on the seventh day. He knew this because God had informed Adam. And the information made its way as far as Moses. That's why back in chapter 2 now, we have this important notation. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Go back to the book of Genesis and have a look around and look at for that phrase, this is the account of, and realize that these are bibliographical annotations by Moses, the editor of Genesis. So chapter 2 of Genesis, it ends with everything in an idyllic state. Adam's living in the Garden of Eden. There's a, a river flowing out of the Garden of Eden. It waters the garden. There's Adam who is working in the garden. He's tending the garden. He's working. Work is good. Work is good. The fall has not taken place. Adam is working. Work is good. Repeat after me. Work is good. That's a really important thing. Work is good. Instructions were given to Adam by God. God said, Adam, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. You may sure, this really important language, underscored in your mind. Adam, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... That you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Those instructions are given to Adam. Next little part of chapter 2 has Adam naming all the animals. And then also there's this little statement that's inserted, but no suitable helper was found for Adam. And so God calls, causes Adam to fall into this deep sleep, and when he wakes up, he sees Eve standing there, causing him to exclaim, she was just 17, if you know what I mean, and before too long, Adam fell in love with her, right? That's not what it says? No, it actually says this. Ah, this is the last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Ideal conditions. Everything, by the end of chapter 2, everything is just perfect and wonderful. And the question becomes now, that we've looked at why is there something rather than nothing and who wrote the book of Genesis and how did he get that information now the next question that we have is how do we explain the world as it is now how do we explain the world as it is now why is there crime and poverty and death why is there war and broken homes and abusive husbands? 
Why is there shame and temptation and a mighty struggle between the sexes? In the last 200 years, the evolutionist has come along and has offered wildly speculative theories. And yet, the Carl Sagans, the Stephen Hawkings, and the Richard Dawkins, as bright as they are and as valiant as they are in their attempts to explain things, they do not explain things in any kind of satisfactory way. Evolutionists can talk about all these different things, but they cannot satisfy in their answers. They can't answer how it is that life came from non-life. They have no answer. They cannot answer how new genetic material is added to old. They have no answer. They can't explain how it is that all living things de uh, 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 demonstrate such complexity. They can't answer that. They can't answer how it is that the universe is so phenomenally precise in every aspect of it change one tiny thing in the universe and the whole thing ceases to be and they can't explain how it is that morality and conscience and good and evil and right and wrong came to be they have no answer to that and then along with the evolutionists came the revolutionaries the Karl Marxes the Leon Trotsky's the Lenin's the Stalin's and they step onto the scene in order to explain why the world is as it is. And they explain that it's because the workers are being oppressed. And the proletariat has to revolt. And capitalism must be replaced with communism. And a hundred years later, all the communist experiments are pretty much over. And communism offers no satisfactory answers to that question. How do we explain the world as it is? In all of human history, philosophers have tried to explain, religions have tried, government has tried, science has tried to explain. But it's only the book of Genesis that tells us sin entered paradise and man fell when Satan, the personification of evil, entered the garden. Here it is from chapter 3 of the book of of origins. And the first three words are the words of our message today. Now the serpent. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You may not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, and neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took the, of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. There may not be a more important, a more telling, a more mystery-solving verse in the entire Bible than this verse 1 of chapter 3. This verse is like a master key that opens up so many doors. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. This is the old serpent, the devil the deceiver, variously called the liar. One thing to take note of is that he is not a self-existing creature. He is not a creature from eternity. He is a created creature. Many of us don't understand that. He is a created creature. Look at the end of verse 1. That the Lord God had made. Elsewhere in the Bible, we are told that this creature was in heaven. 
He led a rebellion against God. He took that rebellion to the earth. And he will one day meet his final doom. But until that final doom comes, we all have a serious problem on our hands. And the problem is this. That your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. In the Old Testament, he's called a serpent. In the New Testament, he's called a roaring lion. And as you see, this was a picture that my very talented father-in-law drew of the devil. How do you explain the world as it is? How do you explain news broadcasts today? You can't. Not without the truth of God's Word telling us that there's a, a real devil who has a real agenda that is built upon one thing. Revenge. The whole agenda of the devil is built on one thing. Revenge. He is bent on attacking God and Everything that God has made to kill, to steal, to destroy, whatever he possibly can. This is the book of origins. This is Genesis. This is history that is passed on in writing. Passed on in writing from the beginning. It is not myth. It is not legend. It is not poetry. It's reality. I, I look you all in the face and I say, this is reality. This is what matches up with reality. It, you know, the presence of a personified evil in this world, in New Westminster downtown, in Surrey Wally Ring Road, in downtown Eastside, or anywhere else you want to talk about, even right outside these, this building here, the presence of a personified evil in this world makes perfect sense. It makes perfectly evil sense. It matches with what we know to be reality. The news verifies this reality every single day. So why do we believe in God? Because to do so matches with reality. Why do we believe that there is a devil? Because to do so matches with reality. And the third question, why is it that we have run to Christ and why are we Christians? Because the core tenets of our faith and the fundamental worldview of our faith matches reality outside these walls and in every corner of this globe. The evidence is on our side. And to reject a creator God to reject a malevolent, evil being called Satan, to reject God's plan of salvation through Christ, all these things run contrary to the evidence of reality. And so that's why this series in the book of Genesis is called not the theory of everything, but the reality of everything. The reality of everything is found in Genesis. What did we come up with back in November, 17 fundamental realities are described in the book of Genesis. The origin is described in Genesis. So just to review here, Satan is a created being who is bent on one thing. What's he bent on? One word, here it is. Thank you. Do you know anything about revenge today? Anyone know something about revenge? Revenge. You know, at any given time, as a pastor, I find myself guiding and counseling and supporting a handful of people, always, there's always a handful of people who are dealing with a situation where someone in their life is absolutely bent on revenge. And what stands out to those people, not the ones who are bent on revenge, but the ones who are being the recipients of the revenge, what stands out to those people and what stands out to me is just how cunning, how crafty, and how clever these people can be in finding ways to vent their spite, their bitterness, 
and their destruction. How did that come to pass? Well, just let someone's anger get the best of them. Let someone's anger possess their soul. Let someone's anger enter their bloodstream like a venomous poison. And that person, exactly like Satan himself, will become the craftiest, wiliest creature who finds new and cunning ways to injure, to undermine, to destroy their adversary, even if it's their own father, even if it's their own mother, even if it's their own wife, even if it's their own friend. And so we Christians are counseled by God's eternal word, which can never change. We are counseled with these words. Never, ever, ever let the sun go down in your anger and do not give the devil a foothold. Because if you give him a foothold of one night of anger, two nights of anger, seven nights of anger, 365 days of anger, before you know it, he's got not only a foothold, but he's climbing all over you like his own personal set of monkey bars. There's no creature in heaven or on earth who has stored up more anger than Satan. There's no creature that has stored up more spite, more venom, for the purpose of revenge than Satan. And he proves it every single day through his relentless attacks against Almighty God, against God's creatures, and against God's creation. There's not a sinner on this planet whom Satan has not misled. There's not a saint in this room that Satan has not attacked. There's not a professor of anatomy and physiology who understands the human body as well as Satan understands the human soul. Remember Martin Luther. Our ancient foe seeks to work us woe. His craft and power are great. Armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Now we could talk about Satan's many modes of attack and kind of have like a systematic theology unfolding here. We could talk about the way he discovers our weaknesses, how he finds our Achilles heel. We could talk about how subtle he is. We could talk about his brilliant sense of timing. His brilliant sense of timing. We could also talk about the weapons that he uses and again be very systematic about it. Talk about his lies, his temptations, his accusations. But what we're going to do instead this morning is we're going to head straight to the text where we find really everything we need to know concerning his modes of attack and the weapons that he uses. And we will also find out most importantly this morning about Satan's Achilles heel because he has one and we must know. We must know, we must know exactly where that Achilles heel is. So here's some things. We need to know that Satan will always question God's word. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Well, what's the answer to Satan's question? Did God actually say that, yes or no? Sorry? No. Some are saying yes, some are saying no. The first thing I want to say is, how would Eve even know the answer to the question? She wasn't there when God gave the instructions. She wasn't created. Aha! The penny drops. She wasn't even there. She never got the original command. Adam got the original command. So why did Satan go after Eve? She was more vulnerable. More vulnerable. Look at this. What did God actually say? We go back to chapter 2. God actually said this, word for word. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. Wow. You may surely eat of every tree in the garden. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you'll surely die. 
What Satan said, God said. Stay with me. What Satan said, God said, is this. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? When you compare those two things, they are as different as can be. God's command, in chapter 2, is generous. It's wide. It's everything's on the house. It's on the house. Go ahead, eat of any tree. That one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Go ahead, live it up. Have a great time out there. Just that one there, that one over there. Just that one. Don't eat from that one tree. Satan's question, on the other hand, is convoluted. It's lawyer talk. It's confusing. He says, did God really say zero? Did God really say you can't? What he's inferring, of course, is that he's questioning God's goodness. He's just slipping that in there. Questioning God's goodness. He's inferring God is this cosmic killjoy. Did God really say you can't eat from any of the trees? How can God possibly be good? How can he be good if he says that? Why would God not want you to have more? Why would he do that? It's crafty. Donald Barnhouse said, Satan will present you 10,000 reasons why it would be a good idea to disobey God's command. Oh, we need to write that down. In our, have it up on our computer screen. Have it up in our bedroom. Have it up in our kitchen on the refrigerator. Satan will present you with 10,000 reasons why it would be a good idea to disobey God's command. The first thing we need to know is that Satan will always question God's word. The second thing we need to know is Satan will blatantly contradict God's word. Starting in verse 4, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows what you, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. It's a major, major contradiction. God said, if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. This is the worst of all possible consequences. You do that, you'll die. Boom. Satan said, no, 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 you won't, be, you won't die. You'll be like God. You'll have these most amazing thoughts in your mind. You'll see things. You'll hear things. And I was talking with somebody during community time about what drugs do to a person. The, the whole reason behind why people take drugs. Because they'll think things. They'll see things. They'll experience. But it's not reality. God said, eat of that tree, you'll die, which is the worst of all. Satan said, no, you won't die, you'll actually be like God, which would be the best of all possible consequences. What I want to point out here is to show you how remarkably, perfectly opposite are the plans of God and the plans of Satan. They are as opposite as you could ever imagine and that is throughout the scriptures. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. And Satan comes to kill and steal and destroy. Polar opposites in every way. Satan will blatantly, unashamedly contradict in the most fundamental terms God's word. Secondly, thirdly, we need to know that Satan will always appeal to pride. When Satan made his suggestion to Eve that God opposes Eve eating from that particular tree and that that would somehow keep her from becoming like God, he was telling her, he was appealing to her sense of pride. And theologians call pride original sin. When you study the um, why Satan was kicked out of heaven in the first place, 
it was because of pride. That was his original sin, pride. And sure enough, it is also the path that sin takes to enter the world. It was through pride. And a very constructive time of self-examination for every last one of us here today would be this. Make a list of all of your sins, whatever your weaknesses are in this life, and figure out what is the element of pride in every one of those sins. It's there. You'll find pride in every single sin, every single weakness, every single bad decision that you make. There is an element of pride. Examine yourself and see if it's true. The Bible says that pride goes before a fall. Any fall, there's always pride that goes before it. Pride has a role in all of our sins and all of our troubles, and Satan will always appeal to pride. We also need to know this, that Satan will appeal to our thirst for knowledge and personal experience. He said, For God knows that when you eat of it, Eve, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So we can say without any doubt whatsoever that it is contrary to God's will for his creatures to have the knowledge of good and evil, right? We can say that without doubt. It is contrary to God's will for us, his creatures, to have knowledge of good and evil. But let's get really specific. It was the knowledge of evil that was the problem. At this particular point when Satan is talking to Eve, Adam and Eve had full knowledge of good. Creation was good. Their life in the garden was good. The fruit that they enjoyed was good. The marriage that they had was good. They knew good. They knew only good. They knew nothing but good. But the temptation that Satan brings to them was to add to their knowledge of good the knowledge of of evil. And you could never devise a greater insult to God, who is the God of good, than to be interested in what is evil. Satan was suggesting to Eve that good was not good enough, that perfect was not perfect enough. He's saying to her, Eve, you need to know, you need to know what evil is. You need to see what it's like on the other side of the tracks. You have to know, Eve. You owe it to yourself to know what's going on. Have you ever had Satan whisper that to you? I think he whispers it to us all the time. You have to know What's going on? You have to know what it would feel like to try that. You have to know what it would be like to go there, to be with that person, to do those things. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, dot, 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 you know what happens next. How did Eve handle all of this? We didn't look at it yet. How did she respond to Satan's incredibly confusing lawyer talk? How did she respond to Satan's blatant contradiction? No, God didn't say that. He's, he, he means this. How did she respond to Satan's appeal to pride and to knowledge, and personal experience. How did she handle all of that? Not too well. In her innocence, and you have to credit her with that, she was innocent, and in her naivety, you have to credit her with that too, she was incredibly naive, which is okay, she was, she was in a perfect world. She found herself to be absolutely no match for Satan's cunning and craft and cleverness. And neither are you. 
You and I are no match whatsoever for his cunning, his craft, his cleverness. Poor Eve, she blunders along and she makes the same mistakes that you and I would make. She's unfamiliar with God's word, his original word. She misquotes. She's unclear. She adds words. She deletes words. She soft pedals the original text. I, I can't show you all of it yet. But when she says this, and the woman said to the serpent, oh, oh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. When, if we had time to compare precisely what she said here in Genesis 3 with what God actually said in Genesis 2, there are not one, not two, not three, not, there are five errors she makes. Five mistakes. So if you want to blame Eve, you can. But if you want to blame Adam, you can as well, because apparently he did not do a very good job informing Eve about what God had actually said. The implications of that phrase and that idea are great. The bottom line is that God's Word is a fixed, literal, precise, inspired text that is sharper than a scalpel. It's able to divide soul from spirit. And any changes, any questioning, any misconstruing, any rationalizing, any contorting, any minimizing, any marginalizing, any twisting, and you're just setting yourself up for a trip not to Disneyland but to disaster land. And so she falls. And so does Adam. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now even though Eve was poorly instructed by Adam, and even though Eve kind of remembered God's word that it was told to her and she remembered it very poorly. Still, she had the option to reject the entire conversation with Satan, but she did not. Instead, she accepted Satan's word over against God's word and Adam did the same. And life on earth has never been the same. Reality was altered in that moment at the most fundamental level. I know it's late. I know. But I can't just leave it there and say, Amen, let's pray and sing a song. When mistakes are made, either you can wallow in your mistakes, you can rehearse them, you can curse them, you can nurse them, or you can say, what can I learn? What can I learn? And my brothers and sisters, this conversation that we've looked at this morning between the old serpent and Eve the naive is the most instructive moment in history. It really is the most instructive moment in history. What can I learn here? Pretty much everything you'll ever need to know is right here. May God teach us to acquire divine wisdom. What is it that makes Satan flee? Is it if we can learn to be craftier than him, then he'll flee, right? No. If we can learn to be just a little more subtle than he is, then he'll flee, right? No. God's Word says in no uncertain terms, don't even try. That letter of Jude that I... Asked Alita, poor Alita, to read this morning, contains one main point, as difficult as the letter looks, but it has one main point, and that is to never, ever, under any circumstances whatsoever, never, ever interact with Satan. Never give him the time of day. It is the dumbest thing you will ever do. Instead, simply do this, acquire and implement ever-increasing amounts of divine wisdom. Satan is violently allergic to divine wisdom. 
Divine wisdom is his Achilles heel. And where will you find divine wisdom? I have a picture of it on the screen behind us. You'll find it in every single page of the Holy Scriptures. You'll find it in every single word of the pure doctrines of God's Word. None of us has the wisdom that we need or the power that we need to repel Satan, but God does. And so in every situation, in every temptation, in every accusation, every time you come across another lie of Satan, always let divine wisdom of God's Word do all the talking. That's what the book of Jude says. Don't interact with them. Let the divine Word do all the talking. God's Word is truth. Satan's words are lies. God's Word is wisdom. Satan's Word is pure foolishness. God's Word is life. Satan's Word is death. And so may God's Word be our food and drink. Seven days without his divine word, is going to make one week. Seven days without his divine word is going to make one week. But seven days with his divine word is going to make one strong. And the devil flees. The main point here, first of all, is you cannot overestimate the value of of knowing God's Word, studying God's Word, marinating your life in God's Word. It is your great defense against Satan's lies, tricks, and deceptions. So my brothers and sisters, are you Satan ready? Are you Satan ready? Because he's coming. He's on the prowl. He always comes. Do you spend time acquiring divine wisdom? Are you able to think biblically when you're tempted? Can you detect statements that contradict God's word? Are you willing to accept as the whole truth and nothing but the truth everything that God's word says about every aspect of life? In other words, do you consider God's word to be reality and authoritative? Or do you find yourself arguing and questioning God's word? Defend the little island of your life, whatever the cost may be. Defend your life against him. Fight him on the beaches, fight him on the landing grounds, fight him in the fields and in the streets. Fight him with three little words. It is written. If you attempt to fight him with cardboard swords, have you ever made a cardboard sword and try to stab someone? Doesn't work too good. If you try to fight him with cardboard swords of reason and debate, like Eve did, discussion, compromise, you're doomed. He'll eat you for breakfast and spit you up before coffee time. But when you fight him with the scalpel blade of God's word, the one that has wounded him so many times before, then you will be victorious. There is still one more point, and it's even greater than this point. May God teach us to acquire divine wisdom And number two, may God teach us to acquire incarnate wisdom. May you run to him who has become to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Who is that verse talking about? Christ. Christ. He is the incarnate wisdom. Let him who boasts, boast in Christ. Let him who battles, battle in Christ. Let him who stands firm, stand firm in Christ. Keep close communion with him. The sheep are never as safe from the wolf as when they are near the shepherd. I love that. Charles Spurgeon. Here's your shelter. Here's the place of safety for every tempted soul. Walk according to the example of Christ and you'll be safe. Live daily in the fellowship of Christ and you'll be safe. Trust always in the blood of Christ and you'll be safe. You'll be safe and you'll be more than a conqueror. Even when Satan turns on his most fiercest jets of subtlety and craft and cruelty, he will flee because he's allergic to divine wisdom. He's allergic to incarnate wisdom. He can't stand the presence of incarnate wisdom. Last page. Divine wisdom is the written wisdom of of God's Word. Incarnate wisdom is the Word who became flesh. 
Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever in our struggle against that old serpent. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.